thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name Come and there we go. Hot mic. Good thing I wasn't saying anything I shouldn't have been. <laughs> All right. We gather together today in worship and engaging a God who gives grace and changes who we are in the deepest way so that we can live as people in grace. We welcome you today in this time of worship to Jesus, the rescuer, the savior. Uh, my name is Nat Erickson. I'm the pastor here. And welcome. We're going to start today hearing just a brief word about Boy Scouts. It's Scout Sunday and Holly Way. So as you may know, many families in our church are deeply involved and Holly's going to give a, a brief 
word about Boy Scouts. And we are grateful for Scouts as one of the many ways that kids are being trained to grow up into wise and responsible adults. And that Scouting involves in that an understanding of the need to know and follow God as well. And, and we are grateful to be able to have so many Scouting families in our midst. Just wanted to run through a couple announcements as we continue on in our time of worship. We are continuing. We started in the book of 1 Peter last week, and we're continuing on in that in the many ways that being called as a holy people in Jesus affects how we live daily life, and we'll continue that. Right now in the back is Passport Kids. They're visiting China today, and we are excited for what is going on back there and continue to be in prayer for it and inviting children that you know for the various weeks. We will have Sunday evening Bible study. We're continuing in the book of Mark with Jesus encounters and the way that Jesus encounters people and the way that we're invited to be encountered by him. Coming up on Thursday this week will be the first meeting for the new boards. So if you have been on a board or have been newly elected, we'll have a meeting for the boards at 6.30. Since there aren't any current board chairs that we'll know of at that point, there won't be a board chair meeting at 6.15. So just show up at 6.30. Um, and related to that, so as you may remember, if you were at the business meeting, we had an empty spot for church clerk. The nomination committee has been making some further inquiries about who would be willing and able to serve in that and has a, a proposal. So that requires a church business meeting. So here's your first announcement for a special called business meeting on February 18th, two Sundays from now, immediately following the service to address the, the nominating committee's proposal for a church clerk. That will be coming up then. Here in our church, we believe and aim to practice the idea that lives are changed in relationships. And one of the ways we're working on pursuing that is this Dinner for Seven groups. It's an opportunity to meet with people outside of church, build relationships, and have some spiritual fellowship in the meantime. If you haven't signed up, we had one in the bulletin last week. If you hadn't signed up, there's more sign-up sheets out on the table in the entryway, or you can talk to me. Um, fill out the information, drop it in the offering plate, and we'll be putting together groups for that soon and getting started next month. So I encourage you to go ahead and get involved in that. And last thing I want to highlight today, next week, we're having a uh, Super Bowl party following the normal service. 
You can wear a favorite sport attire or football jersey. There's also going to be participating in the Super Bowl of Soup. It was started years ago by a, a youth group who thought that hundreds of millions of people watch the Super Bowl. What would happen if everyone who watched it gave a dollar? What could we do to deal with hunger? And it's expanded into a national movement, and we'll be participating in that. Um, so during the service next week, there'll be soup pots to take donations of soup or money for this um, for addressing hunger in our community. And it's just an opportunity to act in discipleship. One of the things we're consistently called to as followers of Jesus is to care for those in need around us. And it's a, a tangible way to do that. And we're inviting everyone into this next week. For the party, we'll be eating lunch back in the multi-purpose room. There's a sign-up sheet on the back. If you know ahead of time you're planning to bring something, if you could jot that down there, that would be helpful. Um, why don't we go ahead and take a couple minutes to say hi to people around you now. That's fine. Now it's on. Our entrance hymn is number three this morning. Number three. We're going to do verses one, two, and four of Crown Him with Many Crowns. We're only going to crown three out of his four crowns. One, two, and four.
uh, please remain standing for the invocation. Prayer for God's blessing. Let us pray. Father, we come boldly before your throne through Jesus, your son, and ask that you pour out your grace. Thank you for making a way for us to know, know and be known by you. We also thank you for our boldness to worship is not hindered by our government. May we experience this freedom of worship continually. And even more so, may we worship you continually so that everyone might see the beauty of your grace displayed in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, our first scripture reading is from Genesis 9, 1 through 7, and it can be found on page 12 of the Pew Bibles. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all of the beasts of the earth and all of the birds of the air, upon every creature that moves along the ground and upon all of the fish of the sea. They are given into your hands. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. And for your lifeblood, I surely will demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of the, his fellow man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth and increase upon it. In our offertory prayer, let us pray. We offer these gifts, O God, from our hands and our hearts. Bless them. Use them to multiply your mercy in this world as you work through many hands to bring honor and glory to your name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Our second scripture reading is from 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 17, and it can be found on page 1888 of the Pew Bibles. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, to command those who do, not do right, or to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. In polite conversation, there are two things you don't talk about, right? They are religion and politics, right? And if you need any proof that the Bible is not an American book, the fact that it routinely talks about religion and politics and how they're supposed to mix together is a good indicator. Religion and politics, yeah. as Peter walks through the reality of being a holy, called people in a world that is not holy and following God begins to address many areas where there's possible clashes for his first readers and, and still for us today in this religion and politics 
comes up right at the beginning. How do you live in a kingdom, in a world where the priorities of the government are different than the priorities of the follower of Jesus? And what do you do? And he leads us and guides us into an important understanding to show the world a hope in Christ that goes beyond politics. Show a hope that is bigger than winning elections and having your say, a hope that is in Christ. And and that is lived out, especially for us today, in a society where we can so freely talk about politics and so freely complain about what we don't like, this showing a hope is lived out by living for the good of the city, the community, the country louder than we talk about politics. And in in living this way, in living for the good of the, the city, we're freed to serve God well even when the winds of politics are not blowing in our favor. We're freed up because we're living in a hope that is bigger than the politics of the day. So Peter talks first about the need to submit to the government. And tied up in that idea of submitting to the government, he speaks also of the need to live in the virtue of honor. We'll begin with this submit to the government. Now at the beginning, it's fair to acknowledge that our experience of government today is worlds separated from the experience of government when Peter was writing under the Roman emperor. You can summarize the way Rome handled things in two brief ways. Pay us your taxes, don't cause trouble, and we don't care what else you do. Live however you like, run things your own way, but pay us our taxes and don't cause trouble. And that's the basic way that the Roman Empire handled people. Our experience of government, government has a lot to say about just about everything we do. And it seems to always want to have more to say about more and more things that we do. So we interact a lot with government. In in Peter's day, they interacted very little with government. But, There's an important similarity that undergirds our relationship is that government still has essentially the same function, which he points to in the text that there's the emperor, there's the governors that he appoints, and he appoints them for a reason, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Or you might say, to keep social order. And this function of government is actually very biblical. We heard, read in that passage in Genesis, which you may not have thought of before in terms of government, but Noah gets off the ark, makes a sacrifice, and and God accepts the sacrifice as pleasing, but then gives him a new command, which was not in place before. Speaks of how if a man sheds human blood, by his, right, he should, be, he should be killed is the basic. It's more poetic in the form there, but the exact words just escaped me. So it's a new responsibility that God gives to people to watch each other and to seek to minimize the evil that one another does. Prior to the flood, there was no such command in place. But after the flood, they're given this command. It's a command of communal governance. And out of this basic pattern of watching one another to seek to limit the evil, right, grows government of one form or another. And of course, in the twisted sinfulness of the human heart, we are also able to use government to magnify the evil that we do. But in many ways, it is a restraint. To greater or lesser success, it restrains the bad that people do 
and enables people to do well. And that's the basic function of government running throughout scripture. And that's basically the function of government still for us today, keeping social order. So submit to the government because they keep general social order, and that's better for everyone. But there's more to it than that. That's a good place to start. But Peter tells you, submit to the emperor and to these governors for the Lord's sake. So he doesn't just say submit because they do good things or because they do right, and oftentimes we know that they don't. He says submit for the Lord's sake. Which is two things. First, it means the way that you submit impacts the way that people see the Lord, which is a theme that's going to run throughout the rest of 1 Peter. As his holy called people, the way that you act impacts who people understand God to be. Used the example last week of a playwright, and we're the actors on the stage acting out God's play. People understand how great the director and the, and the playwriter is by what the, play, by what the actors do on stage. And, and we're like those actors. So one reason is the, the people understand who God is and his intentions by what we do. But a second implication of this submit for the Lord's sake is that there are times and places where submission is not an option for the follower of Jesus. If you're submitting to the government for the Lord's sake, then when the government steps over its bounds and starts saying things that call you to reject what God has said, then you are free to no longer submit to the government, right? Because you're ultimately submitting for the Lord's sake. So we have the example of Peter and the apostles before the Jewish ruling council in Acts shortly after Jesus had been raised from the dead. And they tell him, stop talking about Jesus. And they stand up before him and say, you know, judge for yourselves what's right, but we must obey God rather than man. And that's this basic principle. We submit to the government for the Lord's sake, which means if the government steps beyond what it's supposed to do and starts rejecting the ability to live for Jesus, well, then we are free to no longer submit in those areas. But it, it presents a general posture of submission, a general posture of allowing the governing authorities to do what they're supposed to do, maintain social order. And we might think of it along two sort of related examples. On the one end, submission to the government is that it, it, most basic is like paying taxes. Like it or not, you pay your taxes. Like it or not, you get your car registered. Like it or not, you do these basic acts of submitting to the, the government and the patterns it has laid out to govern our lives. Then there's, at the further end, there's this idea of like pledging allegiance. Now we're all used to this in America, we pledge allegiance to the flag. Um, that's a pretty American kind of thing. In many countries in the world they don't do this. But you pledge allegiance. Pledging allegiance speaks of your own relationship to the government, not just I pay you taxes, but I believe in what you do, I believe that what you're doing is right, and I'm dedicating myself to it. And at that end of the spectrum is where the follower of Jesus is, will run into difficulties from time to time. Because sometimes the government will decide it needs to uh, run the spiritual lives of people. And, and we have to say, no, for the Lord's sake, we will submit but we're not going to change the government into the Lord. We will submit for the Lord's sake. And that's this basic posture, a posture of submission. And practically speaking, this basic posture of submission calls for us to be judicious in the way that we avail ourselves of our rights as Americans. We have the right to complain, we have the right to fight in courts. We have the right to fight in ballots. And those are all good. 
but we should pick our battles carefully so that it's clear our general posture is one of submission to the governing authorities at the city level, at the state level, at the federal level. So we have a clear posture that is ultimately aimed to give honor to God. So submit is the basic posture. And submission to the government is tied up with this bigger virtue of honor. As in verse 15, we read, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So why submit? Well, in doing good, you silence those who ignorantly say, follower of Jesus, you are bad for society. Well, this only works if they're wrong in their ignorance, not if we're actually actively going about living in such ways that are bad for society. The basic principle under it is live a life that is honorable towards other people, towards the people on your street, towards the people at City Hall, towards the people making laws in Lansing and Washington, D.C., a life that is in general honorable to others. As in verse 17, we read, honor everyone, and it ends with honor the emperor. Honor is to give deference to them, to allow them to do what they're supposed to do, to not be known as the one who always has the nasty thing to say about the people you don't like. Okay, to live in honor. And in living in honor, we have the opportunity to silence fools people who pass judgment on God as bad, right? And by living for the good of the city and those around us, we have the opportunity to show that that's a wrong judgment. Now, until the late 1980s, miners who were going underground in Great Britain, England, and the U.S. were accompanied by a little familiar friend, the canary. They brought them down in the coal mines and other mines with them for a simple purpose. Canaries breathe a lot and they're really small. So if there's carbon monoxide or other dangerous gases in the air, they pass out long before it's dangerous for a person. So you see your canary friend pass out, you know it's time to get out of Dodge. So there's the canaries. They're a, a warning for the miners. Okay, we also know a traditional story from the great Greek storyteller Aesop about another type of warning, the boy who cried wolf. And in short, bored shepherd boy decides he'll yell wolf. And the whole town runs out to save the flock from the wolf, but there's no wolf, he laughs. Next day, bored shepherd boy cries wolf. Everyone runs out, no wolf. Okay, next day, there's a wolf. He cries wolf. Nobody comes out. Wolf eats sheep. Basic story. And the principle is simple. You don't trust someone who's shown themselves to be a liar, even when they're telling the truth. The posture which Peter is calling these believers, and which God continues to call us to today, is to be like a canary. Canaries are generally happy, songbirds, generally moving about well, so when something is wrong, it's obvious. The boy who cried wolf is always complaining, always calling out problems, so when something is wrong, it's not even clear anymore that he's not just whining. This life of honor directed towards others should be such that when there is an occasion for you to stand up at work and say, you know what, what is being required of me is actually something I can't do because I follow Jesus and he has said I can't. Or when governing authorities at the state or the federal level start passing laws that 
inhibit living freely as a follower of Jesus. When and if that happens, we stand up and say, hey, this is wrong, and people listen because they're so used to seeing us live well and honorably towards others. So you're like the canary, because they're used to you, they know you, and they know your intentions are good and are willing to listen and willing to put up with you. Honor, love, and fear is what this passage ends with. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God. If you mess up at the honoring everyone step, people can't really understand what fearing God means and why you live the way you do. Likewise, if we mess up at the loving one another as followers of Jesus step, people are again directed in the wrong direction about who this God is. And so Peter is guiding us and challenging us in a really basic way. Does the way that you live with respect to the political authorities over you indicate that you honor them? Indicate that you are for the good of the city and not just trying to make trouble because you're free in Christ. And you know, sitting in this church, we have many people in positions of political authority in this town, right? And we, we want to excel still more. You don't need to, me to tell you that we're coming up in a major political season in our country. Are we ready to excel still more in the ways we speak honorably, even about the people we don't like who may or may not be running for office? We show the world a hope in Christ that is beyond politics by living with the recognition that whoever wins, God is still on the throne. We don't need to fight and win every battle that we could fight and win. We can live with a posture of honor and humility towards those in authority and aim to do good for the benefit of the city so that people around us know and recognize that. And that becomes a platform, ideally, for us to point to the grace of God which transforms our hearts frees us up to serve God well, no matter what the political situation is. So I'm going to uh, kind of break our traditional script here for a service now. And you know, the, the normal way that the service works, of course, is you come, we sing, I talk, we sing some more, and then you leave. We're going to have a time of prayer together right now about a couple different political things. I'm going to lead you through. We can go ahead and, and cue up that music so it'll kind of deaden the, uh, the quiet. And you're free to pray out loud if you want. But we're going to do some acts of submissive prayer about how we live in this political time and place we are at. And I invite you first to think about adopting a, maybe a slightly different posture of prayer that the common way we teach people to pray is with their head bowed and their hands folded which is of course because folded hands have a harder time hitting your sibling um, and as we grow up we're free to do some more things with our hands and you know this is a great posture head bowed it's a, it's a submissive posture but it's also a closed posture it's a protective covering yourself up. At our most instinctual level, that's what we do when we're afraid. We cover ourselves. I want to invite you to maybe think about a different posture of prayer in this time of hands open, whether they're just on your knees, raised up. This is actually, the, as best as we know, the traditional posture of prayer that Jesus and his followers would have used. But this is a gesture of openness before God. And we're going to have a time of openness in prayer before God. So I'm going to give you a thing to pray about. And you can pray quietly if you feel so led. You can pray loud, but other people will be around and hearing. 
going to give us three different ones and we'll take a little bit over a minute of time to pray over them. So first one, I invite you to pray about this. Pray that there will be politics of wisdom in our country so that it is easy for us to keep submitting to our governing authorities. Okay, so I invite you to pray for wisdom in our politics so that it's easy for us to continue living in submission. Go ahead and, and go to the Lord now in prayer for that.
honorable submission, which we have just carried out for our governing authorities. And, and may we continue to live in that. We want to proclaim to the world in our words and in our actions that our hope is in Jesus, not in the politics. We want to live honorably and engage in the political process that we're blessed to have in such a way that people hear grace in our voices and grace in our ballots. And may God so bless us and lead us into that way of living for the honor of his name. We'll have here now a, uh, a short song of response and then we'll be joining in the communion table now. So invite the whoever's leading in the song to come on up. page 427, verses 1 through 3. Go ahead and be seated as we come to a time of communion, of, of worship in this way. I invite you now to this communion, the celebration that we call the Lord's Supper. It's a reminder to us of Jesus who came as a sacrifice, as the perfect Lamb of God. It's also a reminder to us of Jesus who reigns as king, and we are reminded to proclaim the reign of Jesus and the rescue which he has provided for us in his sacrifice until he returns. So I invite you into this time of remembrance and of proclamation. We will uh, first pass the, the bread and then share in that all together, and then the cup and share in that all together. We invite anyone who is following Jesus in faith to participate with us here as we share communion today. Um, we'll go ahead and say a prayer now as we reflect on the, the bread that we will share. Lord, you have given us the bread of life in Jesus, your son, whose body was broken on our behalf, that we might have life. And may we have that life in fullness and freeness. And may we be able to share that life. And God, lead our souls and nourish them as we remember Jesus and his body broken, that we might have true life. In your name, King Jesus, we pray.
Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Join me in prayer now for the cup that we will share. Lord Jesus, your blood is the cup of the new covenant, the covenant of faith by which we might all come to you and receive grace. Lord, may your life blood give life to us, and may we live in the joy of your life praise you and we thank you, King Jesus. Amen. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we join in the faithful throughout the ages proclaiming the life, death, resurrection, and hope in Jesus that we have. This is our custom. We will rise together and sing, Blessed be the tie that binds. And as a symbol, if you feel comfortable with it, you can join hands with those around you. Blessed be the 